lecturing State Senator Michael Barrett. My name is Jeff Barcel. I'm the minister of First Parish Church here in Weston. Uh, and I am pleased to be joined by my colleague, the Reverend Stephanie May from First Parish Church in Whalen, who is serving as our behind the scenes technical host, the person without whom we could not do this. And, uh, and also um, we are joined by Chris Stix, who is a member of First Parish Wayland and a founding member of this new partnership and advocacy group here in Middlesex County. The, Middle, the Metro West Climate Solutions Group is a growing partnership between First Parish and Wayland First Parish Church in Weston, First Parish in Lincoln, the Congregational Church in Weston, and now a few other communities and individuals. Our goal and mission is to provide information on the growing threat and opportunities posed by climate change and share personal and regional strategies for moving towards a low and no carbon based society and economy. The latest scientific consensus tells us that we need to reduce carbon emissions here in the United States by 50% by 2030, and at least 80% or more by the year 20, 2050, in just 29 short years, in order to avoid a potentially dire set of circumstances and scenarios. We gather this afternoon to learn about the state's plans and proposals to address climate change here in Massachusetts and around New England. For what happens here in the Commonwealth inevitably influences and uh, uh, encourages or discourages what happens in other parts of New England. As some of us are aware, there have been two major climate policy stories over the last four weeks. First, on December 30th, Governor Baker's administration issued the 2030 Clean Energy and Climate Plan. It's otherwise already being referred to as the CECP the 2030 Clean Energy and Climate Plan. They also released the 2050 Decarbonization Roadmap Study that informed the writing of that plan. Information can be found on the state's website about these, this plan, uh, and we will also paste a link uh, here uh, in the, the chat box in a few minutes. Then, that was just one story. Then on January 4th, the legislature, under the leadership of Senator Barrett and Representative Tom Golden, released a long-awaited, and I might add a long-negotiated, climate bill, S-2995, an act creating a next-generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy. Despite hearing from many folks around the state, the Governor Baker opted to veto this bill on January 14th. By, by the following Tuesday afternoon, January 19th, at least, at least that's my understanding, Senator, the bill had already been refiled by you. Um, I, I believe it was on Tuesday the 19th. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts about 2995 and why it is so important to help us attain the state's ambitious and important carbon reduction goals. This bill, similar to the governor's roadmap plan, but even more rigorous is a comprehensive piece of legislation that does many things. It obligates the statewide emission, that statewide emissions be reduced by 50% by 2030, 75% by 2040, and at least 85% by 2050, all based on 1990 emissions levels. It seeks to mitigate and address the impacts these changes would have on low income and ask at-risk communities around the state. It creates sector-specific emissions limits for electric power, transportation, commercial and industrial processes, residential heating and cooling, and natural gas distribution mm -hmm. and service. It also, I might add, increases the amount of offshore wind that we must use to generate electricity by 2,400 megawatts for a total of 5,400 megawatts, which is a start. I note that some power market experts here in the Boston area suggest that we will need as much as 22,000 megawatts of wind power. In other words, four times the amount that we have now uh, procured or we're trying to stimulate by 2050 in order to fully decarbonize New England. To put that in perspective, that is building roughly 46 to 48 Kemp Cape Wind offshore wind farms over the course of the next 20 to 30 years. 
This bill will touch and influence every aspect of our lives as residents and market participants and human beings. It only makes sense to hold a forum like this where we have the opportunity to hear from one of the bill's main authors, the main author, and get his perspective on how this legislation and plan can and will play out. Our moderator for this afternoon is Mr. Chris Stix, a member of First Parish in Wayland. Chris is a senior fellow at the Conservation Law Foundation with expertise in financial analysis and energy markets. I'm now going to turn it over to Chris to introduce Senator Barrett and our format for this afternoon. Thank you for attending. Good afternoon. Thank you for choosing climate action over football this afternoon. Um, we're pleased to have with us today the senator who represents many Metro West communities, including Lincoln, Weston, Wayland, and a number of others. In addition to being one of the leading advocates for climate solutions in Massachusetts, in the Massachusetts legislature, he is chair of the Telecommunications Utilities and Energy Committee. Some years ago, he wrote an Atlantic Monthly cover story advocating for longer school days. Um, and he has been the leading sponsor of climate solutions bills in, in the Massachusetts Senate and uh, the, the co-chair of the conference committee for the recently passed bill. Um, Senator Barrett will present for 15 to 20 minutes and then we will take your questions. If you have a question for Senator Barrett, please enter it using the Q&A feature at the bottom of, this, uh, of the Zoom screen, not the chat feature. Um, and we will get to as many questions as we can. And with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Barrett. Chris, very much. Uh, uh, gratitude to you uh, and to Jeff, uh, whose uh, church in Weston is in my district, to Stephanie. Um, and uh, I was, I was, must say, I was looking forward to hearing from Fred Small as well. There was a time, uh, about the same time, Chris, that I wrote that Atlantic piece, when I was state senator for Cambridge and Boston, right? And uh, I used to listen to Fred sing folk songs in Cambridge coffee houses. Uh, I know he's long time been a member of the the clergy since, but he's a very multi talented guy. Just a special shout out as well to other Metro West legislators. Uh, the wonderful Becca Rausch is Wayland's state senator, and she has made, been a major contributor to this bill. Uh, and then I, we, we must, above all of us, give special uh, recognition to the Senate president, right? Because this bill was actually in big trouble about, uh, well, at the time of the governor's veto. It wasn't clear to me when the effort was going to be resuscitated. And the Senate president who represents part of Metro West or South, Framingham uh, and Ashland and other places, Natick, together with the House Speaker, the new House Speaker, Ron Mariano, declared, and this is an exceptional parliamentary moment, that this bill just vetoed by Governor Baker would be immediately resubmitted. That's not something I have the power to do on my onesies. Uh, this uh, was really facilitated by the Senate Pres and by the House Speaker. It meant that you guys, the incredible drive, the incredible momentum you built up for major climate action wasn't going to be dissipated. Uh, the grassroots activists were really vindicated here because the issues remain stage center. I did, uh, although it was really the Senate president's doing, I did resubmit the bill last week. I think we're going to act on it as a Senate and as a House very soon. Certainly that's my hope. So the issue remains front and center and that should be cause for optimism for us all. Of course, the other reason to be very optimistic is the Biden administration. And one of the big differences I have with, respectfully, with the governor in his vetoing this legislation is that their climate plan, the climate plan released on December 30th, did not anticipate uh, Senator Biden's, Vice President Biden's election as president of the United States. And the plan doesn't contain any mention whatsoever 
of the possibility of federal financial assistance to families and to individuals who might need a little help in buying that electric car or a little help in getting rid of the gas or uh, oil furnace in the basement and substituting a modern energy efficient cold weather heat pump. So one of the uh, differences, the friendly differences we've got going with the governor here is that the, the Senate from the start did assume, did hope desperately, but also assumed that a Democrat was going to be around to serve as a federal partner for local activists and for statewide activists. We were fortunate that we were proven right in that respect. But as a consequence, our sense of the state's possibilities on climate action are more optimistic than the governor's because he assumed something quite different. Uh, I will mention as well, although it's it will certainly be of some interest to Metro West folks, that another strange area and accounting, I think, for the administration's pessimism on climate is that the term mass transit doesn't appear once in their plan for 2030 and to reduce emissions. So you've got a situation where a um, overly cautious plan for 2030 on the part of the administration, failing to anticipate any significant role for the feds and failing in particular to even think about major transportation gains for mass transit. No wonder they vetoed the bill. No wonder they had an overly dour view of our prospects here. But that said, uh, listen, um, in truth, the difference between where the administration stands and where the legislature stands is narrow, right? Uh, this, the, the Baker administration in general has been pretty good on climate issues. They've done some heroic work of their own. Uh, and my hope is that we can narrow the differences, uh, bring down the temperature a little bit on the ensuing controversy and have everybody on the same page, which is that, uh, we need a very aggressive approach in the next 10 years and then over the course of the next 30 as we address uh, climate change. Uh, Fred, uh, Jeff, you did a terrific job in describing the bill, so I won't, I won't re-describe it, but I will just make a mention of one of the themes in the bill. And, and that's this idea that at one level, what we've got to do to address climate change is I won't call it mundane exactly, but it's very practical, right? It's, it's very down to earth. There are complexities galore. But when all is said and done, if you wanna have a sense of the challenge that we face, and I'm thinking about all of you listening in here, um, imagine a situation, a set of circumstances that permits essentially everyone in your neighborhood to have an electric vehicle if they own a car at all. Consider the cost of electric vehicles today. Consider the, the, the concern about um, travel distance and, and about uh, charger anxiety. Uh, consider the fact that people are married to their current choices and often comfortable with them. Essentially, all the cars on your street, sometime in the next 10 years, the next time comes to buy a car, that choice has to be electric. In the same way with um, the clothes dryer, there's probably gas in your house or apartment, uh, your reliance on gas or oil for heating, the next time your furnace goes down, the next time the gas stove needs replacing or the next time the gas clothes dryer does, we have to set, create a set of circumstances where you feel comfortable, able to afford and choose a uh, non-fossil fuel alternative and needless to say, finally, the juice that you run through your car to charge it, your electric car, and through your house to heat it, has to be clean energy. Can't be generated by fossil fuel itself. So it's, a, it's a very down to earth, folks. It truly is a grassroots dilemma and a grassroots challenge, but also a set of grassroots solutions. We've got to get electric cars, electric buses through urban neighborhoods. We've got to get electric vans delivering your packages from Amazon. We have to have uh, electric heating systems replacing your oil furnace and even your gas furnace. And that electricity itself has to be generated from solar, from windmills, could be from hydro, and it has to be storable in batteries much better 
than the batteries we have today so that you can tap into it when the sun's not shining or the wind isn't blowing. That in a word is how, um, as I say, how practical the problem is that we face. That's why the federal role, by the way, is so important, right? The, the recovery from the pandemic, and it will come, we will survive this terrible situation we're currently in, but crucial to our realizing our 2030 goals, of course, is that the recovery, the economy will come roaring back, but the re recovery has to be shaped. It has to be a green recovery, a post-pandemic climate conscious recovery in which we zoom into a future that's more optimistic than the uh, moment in which we find ourselves, but is also cleaner and greener, cleaner and greener than the economy that was healthy pre-pandemic. And shaping that post-pandemic greenness, uh, that's on the state legislature, it's on the Congress, it's on the president, it's on the Baker folks, but it's also on all of us. So I'll just close my opening statement by saying, tip of the hat to uh, Metro West Climate Solutions and to all the activists out this way, one of the big changes from, from five years ago is that there is much more determination on the part of uh, citizens to really see something happen on climate. I mean, the fact that you guys, uh, that we attracted as many people today to this conversation on a Saturday, and by the way, uh, Jeff and Chris, we are not competing with football, of course. We're not even competing with Tom Brady, thank goodness. The game starts, um, oh my goodness, I'm wrong. The game started at three. Well, shows you how you lose track of time when you're having fun. Um, in any event, there's a lot of activism out there and it's growing. You might say, uh, while the legislature deserves a lot of credit for what I think is an exceptional bill, and, and I'm happy to have taken a part in writing it, the truth is this was really a response to consumer demand, right? To constituent pressure. So thank you all. So um, before I ask the first question uh, for uh, all of you who are out there listening, if you have a question for Senator Barrett, please enter it in the Q&A feature by pushing the Q&A button and entering it. And we will do our best to answer all the questions. Our first question for Senator Barrett is to ask you to address how the legislature will deal with Baker's rejection of of the bill uh, through refiling it and any changes you feel you need to make to, uh, 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 to, to get it enacted? Well, I don't think we'll take the veto personally. Uh, it's, not like a, it's not like being rejected in love. Uh, this is strictly business. So we're pretty, we're pretty resilient uh, in the face of um, these setbacks. But again, no question, President Spilka's action and, and Speaker Mariano's action and immediately uh, picking us up by our lapels and putting us back on our feet makes an enormous difference. We have refiled it. As I mentioned before, that's exceptional. I Again, I suspect the debate in the House and the Senate will come up very quickly, which is why, by the way, everybody listening needs to redouble their efforts to thank their legislators. Uh, you've already got a great bunch. You've got Spilka, you've got Roush, you've got Cream, you've got Eldridge, you've got the best state Senate delegation in Metro West that one could hope for. You've got representatives like Carmen Gentile, who's terrific, and Tom Stanley of Waltham, uh, Tammy Gouveia of Concord and Acton. Uh, you've, of course, got an exceptional Newton delegation. Uh, you've got um, uh, Alice Peich, who represents Weston. These are already the best people in the legislature, but good people, need positive reinforcement. They need to be told always that they're not laboring in a vacuum. It's meant a lot to me that you guys have really stepped up and have sent letters to the governor and then have told us about it. That needs to continue for the next two weeks. I think we can get this over the finish line. It truly will be. Uh, and for once, we will not be exaggerating, although uh, a little bit of hyperbole is part of the legislative game. We will not be exaggerating this time when we say it's the most aggressive climate plan of its type in the United States. This is very um, focused. We are really ensuring that the rubber is going to hit the road and that if we fall off the pace, we're going to 
and, and I'm talking about me as a legislator or the governor as a chief executive for the Commonwealth, if we fall off the pace, this time there's no looking away. There's no pretending it didn't happen. There's no stalling. We're going to know it. We're going to be held to account and we're going to have to do something about it. That's why this bill changes a lot of state agencies who have kind of, to an odd degree, even though they're supposedly charged with making energy policy, to a significant degree, our state energy agencies have only half acknowledged the reality of the climate issue. They've gone about their business. The Department of Public Utilities, which regulates what you pay for electricity and natural gas in your house, uh, hasn't really, hasn't really conceded that it's gotta be concerned about reducing emissions. In fact, it's explicitly said that its priorities lie elsewhere, no more. This bill uh, holds the DPU to account and similarly with other agencies. So it's all about focus. It's all about no excuses. And uh, I, I, think it's, I think action this year is gonna happen pretty quickly. Um, will the bill need to go through committee again? No, uh, weirdly enough, there are no committees um, as such. It takes us a while to organize ourselves every two years following a, a November election. We haven't organized ourselves. For example, I am at the moment, I am not chair of the Joint Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities and Energy. I'm, uh, I'm in a kind of limbo, uh, a kind of purgatory, something we Catholics uh, are very familiar with. Um, and I hope to chair the committee again, but there is no committee to chair because we haven't organized ourselves into committees either. Uh, all we have, and this is where Spilka's brilliance comes in, is a temporary Ways and Means Committee structure, the House and the Senate. If you have a temporary committee, and I am temporarily on the temporary Senate Ways and Means Committee, chaired by Michael Rodgers of Fall River, who's been a big friend of this bill. If we're on a temporary committee, we can generate and resubmit that climate bill. And we can put it onto the floor even before we've done much of anything else to kind of uh, get ourselves situated. Why do you think the governor vetoed the bill? Some of us heard that he and his supporters opposed the real estate stretch codes and the rules uh, that required disclosing energy efficiency of homes for sale. I, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I will point out that he's done a number of relatively high risk things recently by my count, he did veto um, a bill two months ago that had to do with women's choice. I'm not talking about codifying Roe v. Wade. He's very he's a pro-choice politician. Still, he set us aback and um, vetoed a bill that that seeks to make sure that uh, young women, in particular, have the tools they need if they're confronting uh, a pregnancy. He vetoed police reform, very important to the minority community. In both of those cases, he sent the bill back with proposed amendments. And then when he didn't get all the amendments adopted, he vetoed. But uh, in the case of choice, we overrode those vetoes. In the case of police reform, we didn't have enough votes to override in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. So he won some important concessions. Uh, both of those vetoes are. Um, angered lots of folks. This is a third, this, is, this completes a trifecta in that respect. I don't pretend to know precisely what happened. I do know that in this particular case, he was on safer ground because he didn't anticipate the Senate president's reaction, the speaker's reaction. In vetoing the climate bill, he knew that we could not override the veto, that the legislative session was coming to a formal end. So, he might have thought that he was buying himself six months or so to let the pressure against the bill build. That said, remember, this governor has been pretty good on climate issues, and he has a legitimate point, and that's that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a part of shaping the bill. Now, there, there's some irony there. I, irony is the wrong word. Some English major will, will correct me. There is some uh, paradox there. I did approaches people all during a calendar year 2020 begging them 
to take an interest and they declined. I think their perception was that the House and the Senate would not reach agreement, that there was no need to engage because this was going to be um, uh, an exercise bringing forth nothing. When Tom Golden and I managed to bring the two branches together, it did take us a long, long time. It did come at the very end. His folks had opted out during the process and suddenly he was faced with a very ambitious bill that he had not given, when I say he, I mean his people really, because he's got a lot of other things to think about. His folks had not given much thought to. They're now uh, usefully engaging uh, on things with which I'm gonna continue to disagree, but, but on some things uh, that I can agree with. So we are talking now, uh, there's a very narrow window here the, the House and the Senate have spoken, so major changes can't really be, be entertained. But listen, every piece of legislation can be improved. And uh, there are very smart people in the executive branch who are picking a word there or a phrase there that could stand improving, for example. That's good. There are some big issues, though, that the governor vetoed over. And that's where we continue to be in disagreement. One of them uh, is this question of and I'm sorry for the, for the jargon, a um, specialized municipal opt-in stretch energy code. Stripped from, uh, you strip all the syllables away and a very important idea is there. The question is, when your town is ready to engage with this net zero idea, the entire state has a net zero goal for 2050, as you know, but in addition, Individual communities are wrestling with net zero-ness. The Hastings School here in Lexington that my kids attended has been rebuilt as a net zero elementary school. In the Hastings case, that means that there is a, enough solar generated on site to offset the fossil fuels the school has to use to stay warm. That's, that's remarkable, but it's increasingly becoming the rule. So, what the governor didn't realize and what his people didn't realize is that net zero is not fringy. Net zero is on the cusp of going mainstream uh, in every town in Metro West. When I wrote uh, the net zero stretch energy code into the Senate bill in January of 2020, I did it after we had spent hours with the city of Boston uh, because they found ways to build affordable housing that is net zero non-carbon emitting. Uh, in their case, they couldn't put the solar on the building because when you build up in, into a high rise, there isn't enough of a footprint to generate the solar. But uh, so in their case, they need to purchase carbon offsets from forests uh, and woods and elsewhere to get to net zero. But the long and the short of it is, we didn't do it until we talked to Boston. And we, we asked them the question, can this be done in a dense urban environment? We know it can be done with a single family home in, in uh, Western or Wayland or Lexington. We wanted to make sure it could be done in Jamaica Plain and Roxbury and Dorchester. Then we sat down with Cambridge people, went, taught, met with them for hours once again. Uh, this, we knew that the idea had come, had arrived. And I don't think the governor's people appreciated that. I, I believe they're beginning to appreciate it now. There's one thing I, I do want to say uh, in a tongue in cheek way. Um, it is true that the governor came forward with a version of net zero on December 30th, and that our bill passed uh, on January 2nd, 2021. However, the Senate had passed its climate bill on January 30th, 2020. So the administration had a full year to realize that we were going to do net zero. And they did make sure that it showed up in December, but we had already given them 11 months preview. So uh, that chronology where, where they did a cool thing first and then we passed a bill second could be subject to some revisionism, but hey, who's counting? So how valid are the concerns of the building industry that net zero buildings will be detrimental to the industry? It, it's uh, the, the developers opposed the first stretch energy code Massachusetts ever created, which was back in 2008, 
under the so-called Green Communities Act, the default position of the developers is that the sky will always fall every time you try to build a, a more energy efficient building. They were, they were bad guys <laughs> 12 years ago. And uh, actually they've done some good things in recent years. They have a new executive director whom I really like, but her grassroots membership believes politically that you scream first in order to enrich your, enhance your bargaining position later. So they screamed. The governor shouldn't have heard them quite so readily. Remember, he didn't have context. He didn't appreciate how mainstream net zero thinking has become in terms of the ability of architects and engineers to do cool things. Uh, his ear wasn't as close to the grassroots, I don't think. So when the development community do what they always do, uh, he heard him and responded, I think, with alarm. I like to believe now that um, the administrations, because we're engaging with them, the administration realizes that they overreacted. Do you have the votes, if were the governor to veto again, do you have the votes to override? Yeah, so we're in a different position than we were with police reform when, as I indicated, we didn't have a two thirds majority. The police unions are very strong um, on what became a, really an exciting statewide citizens uh, commission to review allegations of police brutality. We didn't have two thirds in the house. So the governor won some concessions. We have overwhelming majorities on behalf of this climate bill in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And really, again, that's kind of a credit to the folks on this call. Um, the, the climate movement 10 years ago was more limited. It uh, existed in, in some progressive places, especially in Metro West and some prosperous places, but you couldn't find the climate movement in, at, at scale 10 years ago in Lowell, Massachusetts or in Fall River. The climate movement has arrived in urban areas, suburban areas, blue collar towns, white collar places, and that has made all the difference. How does the bill envision expanding electric transmission and distribution infrastructure needed to electrify both transportation and homes? Um, I would say not well. The bill's not perfect, and we're going to have to have a grid mod conversation, which is going to be very difficult, by the way, for all of us, uh, for reasons I'll mention in a moment. Uh, we're going to have to build, to your point, Chris, we're going to have to build out uh, not only the generation infrastructure, which are could be windmills and solar farms, but we're going to have to build out the transmission lines, which are now going to have to be two ways, right? Uh, typically, uh, energy has been Electricity has been, been uh, transmitted to your house or to your place of business. Now your place of business in your house are gonna be generators because of solar panels. And we need to wield that electricity uh, through substations in the other direction too, or distribute it to our neighbors. Here's the problem. And, I, and now you're flogging an issue, Chris, which isn't addressed by the bill because there will always be new things for us to wrestle with. And this is gonna be tough. We are going to need um, a lot more of those really ugly transmission lines. We in and in, in met every place in East Boston, in Sudbury, every place. We are going to have to need many more of those horrible looking sub substations. I think of the the the, the granddaddy of ugly substations is at Alewife, uh, uh, where there's just a field of steel exoskeletons stretching out for as far as the eye can see. And, and they exist in, in my district, of course. There's a major clear-cut transmission line at on the Lincoln-Lexington border that really crosses Route 2A in the Battle Road uh, Minuteman National Park. So they're, they're going to, they're going to be more of those. And unfortunately, you can't put most of them underground where you'd like to put them because the expense goes up by 40 or 50%. Uh, it, it's, it, it's harder to build them when you're gonna bury them and it's harder to repair them once they're buried. So as a practical matter, a lot of them are gonna be above ground and everyone hates them. And I think in, it is fairly true that everyone, all of us will cite environmental reasons for resisting them. 
because everywhere they go, you're taking down a tree, uh, you're ruining a view. There will always be environmental kinds of objections. And yet we cannot get to where we're gonna need to be, which is to deeply electrify all your cars and all your houses and all your businesses, all of our houses, businesses, and homes. We're not going to get there uh, without building out the grid at the same time that we take down the natural gas infrastructure. So the trade-off, the social contract is that we've got to shut down the natural gas industry or come close to it as we build out the electric power industry. Uh, that mean, That's good for the Merrimack Valley. It means they're going to be at many, we hope, uh, much less risk of something exploding in Lawrence because we will trans transition off natural gas. But the electric power piece is going to be a sighting hell. Uh, we're going to be some combination of genuine environmental objection and then just sheer nimbyism is going to drive resistance everywhere we turn. And that's going to be tough. Um, turning to uh, the plan that the Baker administration uh, published on December 30th, um, how relevant, uh, given, the, given the bill that passed in January and that you're likely to pass again, how relevant is the executive branch um, climate action plan? And I believe comment, public comments are due by February 22nd. Is it important for us and for all climate, uh, those concerned with the climate to comment on that? And if so, what should we focus on? What's that deadline, Chris, you just gave us? February 22nd. Here's my hope. My hope is that uh, well before February 22nd, we have a new climate law in, in the state that will reorder the administration's timeframe. Uh, for one thing, there needs to be a plan for 2025. Uh, the plan will require that limits be set for 2025 by subsectors. Right now, there's one big number that we need to aim for in this in current, under current law for 2030. Now we're going to have a big number for 2025 as well as 2030. And we're going to have a serious number for transportation and then a separate one for residential buildings. And then a third one for commercial and industrial buildings, a fourth one for, in, for business, for industrial processes, I should say, for industry. We're gonna need one for our natural gas infrastructure and a sixth one for electric power. So it is back to the drawing board. Uh, we knew that at the end of calendar year 2020, the administration would be coming out with a 230 plan because they did so in, under the requirements of the 2008 Global Warming Solutions Act that we've just rewritten. So we knew their 2030 plan was coming. That's why it was so important, we thought, to engage with the administration so that we could sync up these time frames. That engagement, uh, despite my best efforts, did not happen. Um, but we've written this bill sensitively, I think, of necessity. We're going to need a 2025 plan now, and I, I hope the administration accepts that. Uh, but in other ways, we've tried to make sure that as much of their thinking can be reclaimed as possible, but it needs to be much more specific. Uh, they're going to have to tell us, uh, this is another part of the bill that we passed, and it's an innovation compared to current law. They're going to have to give us a count. How many electric vehicles are owned in Massachusetts? How many electric vehicles are we going to need by 2025 just to stay on the pace towards 2030 and 2050? How many heat pumps do we have? No one knows. A, a census of heat pumps, uh, as opposed to gas and uh, oil furnaces, has never been done. Yep. And so it's going to go. So we're getting real. And to that extent, the administration is going to have to uh, regroup a tad and do some additional work. So leading economists have always uh, promoted carbon pricing. How is carbon pricing handled in the bill and how would you like to have it handled? The Senate, uh, to its enormous credit in January of 2020, became the first legislative body in the United States to authorize uh, carbon pricing by a series of deadlines. We 
we got the votes we needed. Uh, I've been working on this, as some of you know, since 2013, a long time. In the end, we got the votes we needed by changing direction. Uh, I'm in favor of a revenue neutral carbon fee. Other activists want a, re a revenue producing carbon tax. The administration favors these cap and trade arrangements like REGI and like uh, the administration's newest initiative, the Transportation and Climate Initiative or TCI. All forms of carbon pricing can do the job if, if you set the price of, price of pollution, polluting high enough, which is a common failing. Typically politicians blink when it comes to actually setting these rates. But in theory, carbon pricing is crucial essentially to correcting the underpricing of fossil fuels in today's market. There is a reason why natural gas is so popular and why it's so cheap. That's fracked stuff coming from Pennsylvania and other places at enormous cost to the people in Pennsylvania, I might add. Uh, lots of methane leaks along the way, especially at the site of production, which tend to be out of state. The cheap gas makes its way through pipelines to us and we haven't built into that price the health implications of burning natural gas and of course the climate implications of driving up emissions. The carbon pricing writ simply is simply a, an attempt to honestly price the product so that it incorporates all the bad stuff that you're paying for at the moment in terms of hospital bills for people with COPD or in terms of uh, Great higher seawalls that you've got to build due to rising oceans. We're just trying to get the price to be an honest price. It was in that Senate bill. I tried hard to get it into this final product. That's an area where, um, where, I, where I failed to make the sale to my House colleagues. They're, they're not quite ready to go yet. So there's always additional work and additional education to be done. Um, what has the response uh, from the power and gas utilities been to the bill that, that you passed? Well, you know, they, um, it, it's been muted. They haven't been, uh, they're not quite where the developers are, way out front uh, yelling and screaming. Uh, there, there's some good stuff in this bill for them. Remember, I want to see the utilities move off natural gas, but I'm in favor of the utilities electric business getting bigger because deep decarbonization requires deep electrification. They appreciate that their electric business is going to do well, even as I hope they accept that their natural gas, natural gas business is going to atrophy. Um, but there are some other things going on. The House had a number of provisions that did wind up in the final bill that permit the electric utilities to get into solar. Uh, about 25 years ago, we told Eversource and National Grid, or the, the companies that they then were, that they couldn't be both generators and transmitters because it was a conflict of interest. Uh, they were going to favor their own electric sources if they continued to have them or not. So we uh, separated the generation of electricity and the wheeling of natural gas from the retail and final mile service for your house, which of course is branded as Eversource or National Grid. We're now saying to Eversource and National Grid, look, we want you out of the natural gas business. So we're gonna let you back into not only, uh, we're gonna let you back into the energy generation business if it's clean. If you want to, if you can strike a deal with a city or town and they welcome you into the community and you're going to put solar panels on land you own, Eversource, uh, we're going to make it legal for you to be a generator once again. So there's stuff in, in here for the utilities. They have to become different kinds of companies, but uh, they don't have to, they certainly don't have to go out of business. Uh, we want them in the clean energy business. And um, I think they, they recognize that that's a pivot they've got to make. How confident are you that the sources uh, powering electricity will be truly green in the near future? Are we providing enough in cent carrots and sticks to develop wind and solar? Well, that's a good question. And I think that discussion is gonna continue through the 
the decade, um, I expect to see some new energy, new climate legislation filed for the 2021-2022 legislative session. But I can tell you that we do something in this climate bill that's important. We increase the so-called RPS or Renewable Portfolio Standard. It's a it's a terrible uh, clunky term, uh, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. It's basically a quota. We tell the utilities, and we have told them since 2008, that in every year, uh, the percentage of total electricity they buy from these independent generators has to be clean. So we increased the quota. We increase it under this bill. Uh, but we don't require, for example, that it be 100% green by 2030. Uh, that uh, has some logistical challenges, although it's aspirationally where we want to be. We're going to be much less than that, even with the new RPS standard, but we're signaling that essentially the grid has to be 100% green before 2050, certainly, right? Because you can't get to net zero by 2050 for the entire economy unless you've got green juice going into those electric cars and into those electrified homes. So greening the grid actually does need to come first and we need to have a deeper discussion about when we can pull this off. Uh, right now, I'm gonna show you my iPhone. I've got a um, app on my iPhone uh, that will tell us right now uh, it's an ISO New England app, what our grid is right now. And you will be shocked at, at the, but this is a, a good test of uh, how difficult it's going to be to go to 100% green. Right now, Chris, and I just checked my phone. Yeah, we're 47% natural gas. Thank you. 24% nuclear. We're only, we're 15% hydro and only 12% renewables. Actually, at this moment, we're 2% coal. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So if we're at 47% natural gas today and 24% nuke and only 12% renewables, and we want to bring that 12% up to 100%, and by the way, when all that renewable energy is generated, it's got to be stored so that as I, when the windmills, when the, when the blades aren't whirring and the sun's not shining, we've still got electricity. We need the help of the feds. This is a major, major transformation. And it's, uh, it's important that we get real, but also that we get determined to make the transition. Um, some people feel that uh, grassroots is not gonna work and that we need a national and multinational approach to uh, uh, climate solutions. Um, if, if that's right, how do we move the needle at the national level? Well, I don't, I, I don't quite grasp the distinction. Uh, the grassroots is what drives national action. The grassroots is what drives state action. Ultimately, the international grassroots is going to drive international action, right? So a, a lot of this stuff uh, has to be top down, but a lot of it has to be bottoms up. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, most of the progress we've made in reducing emissions in Massachusetts to date has been in the electric power area. While, uh, while those data we just, Jeff and I just quoted to you, indicate that we have a ways to go, right now with 15% hydro, 12% renewables, and actually nuke is clean, although it has comes with problems that, as, of its own, as you know. So as I count this, we're actually at this moment, 49% dirty, that's 47% natural gas and 2% coal, but we're 51% we're right. clean this afternoon, counting nuclear and hydro. Um, but that's the area where we have the most top-down mastery. The state of Massachusetts runs the electric utilities and the natural gas utilities within our borders. Doesn't control the, the, the pipelines that cross national and international boundaries, but does control the stuff once it reaches Massachusetts. It's not true for cars and trucks, right? Uh, it's a, I can order Eversource to buy an ever increasing quota of clean energy. I can't really order my neighbor to buy a Tesla. Uh, I can't order my neighbor to, 
to uh, to do what I did, by the way, this week, uh, our <laughs> our electric our natural gas clothes dryer did fail last week in the middle of winter at a time when you can't go to a coin operated laundromat for COVID reasons. We did have to make an immediate decision, and uh, I'm well aware that my constituents writ large are going to have to make these decisions at a moment's notice. It's not as if you plan for your stove to fail. You're caught off guard every time. And yet we have to have such awareness in our constituents that they, well, they do what we did. I mean, I, we're, we're reasonably aware because this is kind of the, the business I'm in. So we decided to rewire our utility room so that the clothes dryer that we replaced and that we desperately needed right away would be electric rather than gas. It cost us $1,200 because we didn't have enough, the right kind of electric wires in the places where the gas dryer had sat. It cost us 1200 bucks because we needed to bring in a, a plumber to turn off the old gas system to make sure we didn't blow ourselves up. Then we needed to bring in an electrician to wire for the new electric clothes dryer. And that's in addition to the $600 we spent on the unit itself. So there's a, uh, the $600 was avoidable. We use consumer reports to get a, as good a deal as you can hope to get. But as I think of my neighbors and as I think of Chelsea uh, and, and the folks uh, in other neighborhoods, rich and poor, $1,200 just to change the clothes dryer from gas to electric. Again, this is very nitty, it's all grassroots. We need the feds to help us with financial supports and we need the state government to do the same and we need local government to be very committed but there is a sense in which all of this is up close and personal we've got to help families uh, so that when the clothes dryer goes down or the stove goes down or the hot water heater which is often natural gas goes down or of course the natural gas furnace goes down that uh, people know about the electric option and can afford it. Is, is the goal here um, to um, remove carbon or, or generate on a net basis less carbon or, or is 100% renewable energy the goal? Um, we note that the governor's plan calls for clean energy or low or no emissions. So we're, um, uh, and, uh, the, the question here also uh, asks, does nuclear have an ongoing role? Well, first of all, Chris, you, you and, and whoever is backing you up ask very good questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, listen, there's gonna be a very a vibrant debate about what qualifies as clean. And already the clean energy community is divided, right? Uh, we all know that solar and wind are clean. Some of us, um, some folks are ambivalent about hydro because it's out of state hydro. It, a lot of it is sourced in Quebec on what are or were native lands. So you've got to, and of course it has to come through Maine or New Hampshire. So those folks are fighting uh, the clear cut transmission lines that are part of this build out, build out of the electric infrastructure that all of us are going to need in one form or another, unfortunately. So uh, hydro is controversial, nuclear is controversial, wood to energy, biomass is controversial, uh, and there's a major plant proposed for the Springfield area. Waste to energy is controversial. The oldest waste to energy electric plant in the United States of America is in Saugus and is the subject of a column today in the Boston Globe. People in Saugus, Revere and Lynn would like to see that place gone. Citing solar has become a flashpoint. There are many open space and uh, uh, advocates are fighting solar farms on the ground where they can be most inexpensively built. They want them on roofs or in the few remaining site in Massachusetts, relatively speaking, that are currently dirty, so-called brownfield sites where it's reclaimed industrial land. But there aren't enough brownfield sites left and there aren't enough south facing roofs necessarily left. The quickest way to deploy solar is ground mounted. 
that's become a very sensitive topic in central and western Massachusetts. I don't need to tell you that windmills have also become sensitive. You don't see too many on ridges in Vermont because people fight uh, the visual distortions that are involved. Falmouth has a windmill that it's shut down because the high pitch whirring bothers some of the neighbors. This is, and of course, as we all, as I mentioned earlier, everyone wants to fight that electric transmission line and its ugliness uh, coming to a town nearest you. This is gonna be very tough and there are trade-offs. Uh, we're in general, not a society that's willing to accept anymore the idea that there are trade-offs. Um, the instinct is to assume that it isn't gonna come out of my hide. You know, this idea of the commons and the common good has taken a beating, not least because of the fellow we had as president for the last four years, he validated the feeling that you don't have to make any sacrifices whatsoever for something called the common good. Of course, we don't, we don't wanna be lulled into making too many either. We don't wanna be victimized because we're lectured to. It's gonna be a son of a gun. And each of us, uh, you know, the, 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 the clergy, which are really our chief repository of ethicists and ethical thinking and, and musing and inquiry uh, are really going to have to ha going to have their hands full because these choices are ethical choices as well as logistics choices and cost choices. And every parish, every congregation, every temple, uh, every mosque, every church is going to have to ask uh, what is the balance that we should be striking? Let me... Um... I think uh, we're approaching an hour now. So let me ask one more question and then, uh, uh, and then, and then let's close. Um, is it really possible that we're going to be able to reduce emissions by 2050 by 85 to 100%? And what's the most important thing that the folks who are with us today can do to make that happen? I think that uh, it, it, it certainly is possible, but um, it's going to take an all of the above approach. We need to elect presidents and members of Congress who are consistently committed to the climate issue. And that's not the country that we've had over the last 30 years, right? The somehow, and, and a lot of you took part and helped uh, with those elections in Georgia and before that, elections in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan. We're going to need to go back immediately and do that. Here in my house, my wife, my daughter, uh, her fiance and myself, we all took part in that Georgia election remotely, right? Uh, that's gonna have to continue for the next two years. You need a federal partner consistently. Then you need a state government committed to being a vanguard, way out front leading in this stuff. You need a mobilized grassroots constituency. The most important areas for us to work in, transportation and buildings. So again, it, it's all local. Tip O'Neill's adage about all politics being local uh, is true with respect to the climate issue. The, the, the question to ask in your discussion group is, okay, folks, how could we um, help families in our town what level of government needs to make, again, the electric vehicle affordable, the heat pump replacement for a gas or oil furnace affordable. There are solutions. I'll just mention one solution at the end. This, this is not impossible stuff. I mentioned that get cheap frack natural gas tempts people to stick with gas as a heating source. 29% of Massachusetts though uses heating oil. I can make the financial case to you right now that if you've got a oil furnace, there's no question but that you should go to electric heat pumps when that oil furnace gives out. So 29% of the buildings in the state and the houses in the state are prime prospects. And if you were sitting in Weston or Wayland or Lincoln or, or Lexington, you wanted to say, what's an action plan? An action plan is to inventory the gas heated buildings and houses in your town and to immediately begin to target homeowners with a good news message about the affordability for them at least of uh, heat pumps as an alternative. 
Senator Barrett, uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us today. And I also want to thank uh, Reverend um, Lord Snell and Reverend May for helping to end the whole uh, Metro West Climate Solutions team for organizing this event. Great job, guys. Metro West Climate Solutions will be sponsoring an event in February focused on zero waste recycling. It will feature Christy Pecci, who is the director of Zero Waste Project and a senior fellow at the Conservation Law Foundation. She will share how municipalities are promoting zero waste principles to cut trash, uh, improve reuse, um, refine recycling, reduce carbon, and implement expanded composting. The webinar is scheduled for late February, and we will keep you posted on the date and time. Um, I also, uh, there's in the chat is a link to sign up for Metro West Climate Solutions newsletter, which informs you of events on climate solutions in the Metro West area. Uh, please sign up. Thank you again. Thank you, folks. And again, please thank Senator Rausch, Senator Spilka, uh, Senator Eldridge, Senator Cream, your Metro West, uh, and your House members, too, for doing a great job on these issues. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Senator Barrett, Chris, Jeff, and everybody who was here today.